Did the power fail just a minute ago? Okay, all right. Uh, because I, I was praying and things went wrong, and I, I thought, well, goodness, I'm having a spiritual experience here. Uh, anyway, I do appreciate the, the fact that you've allowed me to show this to you um, again. That is the birthday of the body of Christ. I know I've done it several times, but uh, trying to get everything done and prepared for Operation Flip Flop or the rapture of the, of the body of Christ, it's, it's consuming a whole lot of time. And with this thing with Altoona and, and other things, uh, you may hear just a smidgen of repetition. Hopefully it will, will not be boring to you, and, but be challenging as you see some of these things again. Now what uh, we're doing here is showing the birthday of the body of Christ. Now we do that so that we can come back and show the rapture of the body of Christ and uh, the timing of the tribulation. And that is, uh, that's real important that we establish the beginning before we establish the end. But one thing that I did want to do was show you uh, a chart uh, that we have shown before with regard to the two bodies of Christ. Uh, do you know that um, if you were <laughs> hearing this for the first time, you would probably uh, have furrowed brows and say, Two bodies of Christ, two Christmases. I mean, what in the world? Uh, this guy is off the wall or his rocker or whatever. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And yet, that's exactly what the Bible teaches. I don't know if you know it or not, but we have discovered a truth that has been long neglected in Christendom. That Jesus Christ has not one, but two bodies. And that though we've never seen body one, we have seen body two. We're looking at members of that body right now. And uh, the thing is, we can pinpoint biblically when the two bodies began. In verse number nine of Matthew chapter two, when they had heard the king, that is the wise men had heard King Herod, they departed and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding joy. Now, most probably Jesus was a little older than, than the uh, babe in the cradle uh, uh, or manger that we have him here. But this is the typical picture we have of the Christmas star. The night indicates the blackness and darkness of man's sin. Jesus Christ was born under law. And uh, there is uh, no place in history where man's sin is brought out more fully than under law. The law is holy, just, and good, and we are unholy, unjust, and bad. And so man was in desperate straits. But even though... Uh, man could not save himself, born under law. The law was pointing out his incapacity. Uh, we have the star. Now, this is the, the Christmas star, and it's shining down on the babe in his birth. This is, of course, body number one. And the star was present as an indication that what was being or what was being seen at that point was the body of Christ. Now, if you will, come with me to Acts chapter 26. Verse number 13. Now we come to a whole different picture. And that picture is daylight, noontime, when the sun is shining at its brightest. And there is going to be an event involving the star that is going to outshine the sun. Why? Because this is an act of God's grace. The night pointed out man's sin, and uh, the daylight pointed out the fact that uh, there is a, a light that is uh, bright that uh, shows uh, as far as God's working is concerned with mankind. But this light is going to outshine that natural brilliant light. Because grace, where sin abounded, grace abounded more. 
And so grace is going to outshine the sun. Verse number 13. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journey with me. Now, in the light then, in the, the Christmas star, the Apostle Paul was taken because there was someone else in that star, Jesus Christ. And there, of course, is verse number 16, Rise, stand upon thy feet, I have appeared to you for this purpose. This is body two. Body one was born of a woman, born under the law. Body two was born by an act of God's superabundant or exceeding grace. And so here we have the Lord Jesus Christ on the one side appearing to Saul of Tarsus who became the Apostle Paul on the other side. And it's important as we have pointed out many times to note that the one body cannot be part of the other body because it must keep its distinctive Jewishness. And simply because of that, you can keep them straight. One is neither Jew nor Gentile. One is thoroughly Jewish. One is a body of people as an organization and an organism uh, united with Christ. The other is simply a human body like we have, uh, just one. So keeping this straight, the appearances of the stars, night and day and so forth, you can see where the two bodies were born. This is the body born of the Virgin Mary that actually hung on the cross and will sit on the throne of David forever. This is the body that is united uh, uh, inseparably with the deity of Jesus Christ. And uh, we share together in all that he has and all that he was before the foundation of the world. And we represent him throughout the universe, taking the place of the, the uh, fallen and the faithful angels, angels who doubted, who lost their ruling positions. All right, let's go back then to uh, Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Now, in this chart, we have four simple points. And these four points designate the boundaries of the mystery. If you want to know when it starts, if you want to know when it stops, all you have to do is look at, at this chart. Uh, and in my opinion, there's no arguing with it. Why do I say that? Well, simply because... Anybody who is anybody that's a dispensationalist will always say, well, it stops at the rapture. And I'll always say, yes, it does. We know that. What is the rapture? Verse number 13 of Titus chapter 2. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of that great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, as we go to point number four, there isn't one person, an Acts 2 dispensationalist, an Acts 13 dispensationalist, who will not say, well, yes, it ends in the rapture. Jesus Christ is going to come back in the clouds of glory, and uh, there's going to be a bright fireball, and he's going to catch away the church. And, of course, that is point number three here. And point number three, uh, that represents the, uh, the second body of Christ, body two, where it is completed uh, all the way back to the Apostle Paul. He was the one who was first saved. He's the first physical member of the body of Christ, body two. There are those who are added all the way and God is still adding them. The fact that you got saved at this point in history and you got baptized by the Spirit and were placed into the body is an indication that God is still working under the tenets of grace. But one day the body is going to be completed. Those which are dead, those which are alive shall be caught up together. Nobody is going to be the body of Christ uh, as far as uh, being seen in the heavenlies without every other member. We're caught up together into the clouds of the air, into this glorious appearing. And from that point on, we will be seated with Christ in the heavenlies. So we admit and we know the ending now, 
for some reason, they have missed the obvious. What is the beginning? Well, if it ends with a fireball, if it ends with a glorious appearing, don't you suppose uh, that it should begin with a glorious appearing? The answer, of course, is yes. Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. And verse number 11. And that brings us all the way back to point number two. Now, I'm doing this because I'm, I'm going to show you in just one minute another chart where we're going to fit in the dispensation of grace and contrast it with the uh, ascending and descending of Christ under law. And then we're going to show you the ascending and descending of Christ under grace. We're going to contrast the two. We're going to put this right in the middle of something else that is going to show you beyond a shadow of doubt that we are right in our assertion that it started right when Jesus Christ came down and in that uh, blazing uh, ball of fire, uh, saving the Apostle Paul, that's when the church began. Paul says in verse 11, in testifying as to the brilliance of the light. He already says it's brighter than the light of the sun, but he's on the inside. Now as it, the, the fireball begins to lift off, he begins to gaze up like the apostles did on the Mount of Olives. But this time, when I could not see for the glory of that light, it was another glorious appearance of Jesus Christ according to mystery. Now, the question we need to ask, is point four a glorious appearance of Jesus Christ according to mystery? The answer to that is yes. The rapture is not a prophesied event until you come to Paul. He tells us it's going to happen in the future. But as far as the people under law or any other dispensation, they knew nothing of a rapture. The apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost did not know the rapture of the church. He never preached the rapture. He's not going to go up in the rapture. Uh, boy, is that... Uh, a shock to some people. But this is part of mystery doctrine. Well, if it ends with a glorious appearing, according to mystery, where do you suppose it begins? With a glorious appearing of Jesus Christ to the uh, Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, according to mystery. So here are the boundaries. Once Christ received the title head of the church when he was seated at the right hand of the Father, his next assignment was to come down, save the Apostle Paul, his next assignment will be to wait until his second body is completed. Then he'll call it home in another glorious appearing and take us up to be with himself. Okay, now, I've uh, changed a few things here. At least you'll not be seeing circles all night. Uh, turn with me back to the book of Zechariah. Chapter 14. Okay. Now we're going to go to the time when Jesus Christ returns to the earth. Verse 1. The context is the day of the Lord when he literally comes back to earth to save Israel as their king. He gathers all nations against Jerusalem to battle. He's going to cut them off and fight for Israel. Verse 3. And then his feet shall stand that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem. So it's quite easy to see then, as we trace this down, that Jesus Christ is going to come back and he's going to stand upon the Mount of Olives. That's what this is. Okay. But was there a precedent set? Yes, there was. Turn with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1.
he goes up from the Mount of Olives. And in keeping with prophecy, the angel said, let's look. Verse 9, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now just hold your place right here and come with me to the book of Revelation chapter 1. The book of Revelation chapter 1. Now I want you to note that people saw him going up as they beheld a cloud received him out of their sight. Now he's coming back to the Mount of Olives. Verse 7, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him, all kindreds of the earth, shall wail because of him. As he comes back down to the Mount of Olives, he is seen. Now, let's uh, go back then to Acts chapter 1. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven, verse 10, Two men stood by in white apparel. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up to heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olives. So, we have two events of Jesus Christ. He ascended to heaven from the mount of Olives. He is going to come back at the end of the dispensation of law from the Mount of Olives. Now, all we have to do is put the dispensation of grace right inside of there and see a reversal. Jesus Christ, for the dispensation of grace, comes down first and then goes up. Under law, he goes up and then comes down. He has to come back to his throne on earth. That's, uh, that's the purple here and the brown. He, he goes up from the Mount of Olives as the king of the Jews. He comes back to the Mount of Olives. He ascends first, then he descends. Now all we have to do is reverse that for the dispensation of grace. If we want to know where it starts, all we have to do is to trace. And here is the beginning of body two. He comes down in the Shekinah glory star. And he leads the first member of the body of Christ, the second body, to a saving relationship to himself. Then, at the end of this dispensation, what does he do? He brings that body home. First of all, he's on earth, he goes to heaven, he awaits in heaven and comes back down to earth. The second, he is in heaven, he comes down to earth, the body is forming and in existence on earth at that time, then he takes it back to heaven. So this particular chart right here, in my mind, absolutely sets the record straight. If you have any doubt now, if you have somebody who says, well, it was Acts 13, uh, you have to be gracious and kind, but you can just simply say, uh, you, your oars are not all in the water. You've only got one row in there. Because it had to start right there in the fireball. From here to here, just as this, uh, started when he ascended he is going to come back down to that mount now again why why all the fuss and the bother hebrews chapter one hebrews chapter one Jesus Christ originally was given a throne. As God, upon creating the universe, the Father seated him at his right hand. Now this is something else. Every, everything is given with regard to the, the first session of the humanity of Christ. And it's important. It's important to us. We have belabored that point. But let me belabor another point, And that is... 
Originally, God the Father seated the deity of his son at his right hand when he created the universe and the angels. Note verse 8. But unto the Son, he said, thy throne, O God. Jesus Christ was not humanity for perhaps billions of years. He wasn't humanity for at least 4,000 years of human history. Well, what was he? He was God. Where did he sit? In the throne at the right hand of the Father. That's where he's seated. How do I know? Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, Jesus Christ, even thy God, the Father, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Who were the fellows? The angels. Jesus Christ created the universe and gave angels rule. He gave them thrones and dominions. Now, please remember... We have studied this before, that there are two types of angels, fallen and faithful, but both forfeit their thrones. Why? Because one disbelieved and the other doubted. And God the Father says, look, I won't send you to hell, but here's what I am going to do. I'm going to take the inheritance away from you as far as being a ruler in the universe, and you're going to become a servant to those who are heirs of salvation. Just think, we're going to have angels to do our housework and cooking and working for us, gardening, whatever. They are the servants of the heirs of salvation. Why? Because we're tending to the important things, ruling like they did originally, but they can no longer rule. Both the faithful and the fallen angels have forfeited that forever with two words, the fallen disbelieved, the faithful doubted. So now, uh, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. We need to come to a, another throne in the universe that is important. Two uh, portions, Ezekiel chapter 28. Now, Jesus Christ is actually the one doing the talking here. Ezekiel chapter 28. And he's talking to the anointed cherub that covers. Jesus Christ was a, uh, the anointed Christ. I've anointed you with the oil of gladness. But Lucifer was the anointed cherub. Now what does that tell us? The father anointed the son and gave him the second uh, in command as far as the universe is concerned. The son anointed Lucifer and gave him the third in command. The one higher than Lucifer was Christ. The one higher than Christ was the Father in this hierarchy, this chain of command. Verse 12, you seal up the sum, you're full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You've been in Eden, the garden of God. Verse number 14, you were upon the holy mountain of God and walked up and down the stones of fire. You are, verse 14, the anointed cherub that covers. Now, how, how did he get this position? Verse number 14, second phrase. I have set thee so. That indicates that as the Father gave the Christ a session as God, the next appointed throne and position of power was from the Son to Lucifer. The most powerful, most beautiful, most intelligent, created being ever. Now, go to Isaiah chapter 14. In Isaiah chapter 14, we have the strategy of Lucifer to be as God. Now, it is especially an attack of Lucifer and uh, one third of the angels upon Jesus Christ. How do we know this? The father said to the son, sit here till I make your enemies your footstool. It, it's your enemies. Now, it's not that they weren't the father's enemies because they uh, were uh, 
opposing the Father's plan and appointment. But in particular, they were the enemies of Jesus Christ. Sit here till I make your enemies your footstool. Several times that is said in the scripture. Verse 12, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Here's what happened. Jacob's ladder, for any of you who are Trekkies, you understand the, the concept of a wormhole through space. It is the ability to open up dimensionally uh, a wormhole through space and, and, and make a shorter distance through space so you can traverse the great distances of the universe in a shorter period of time. Jacob's ladder is a wormhole. It opens up. Jacob was, was sleeping on a stone and he happened to be right, right over the gate of Jacob's ladder. And he, in his dream, it opens up and he looks right into heaven and sees Jesus Christ standing there and the angels ascending and descending through this uh, uh, warp, as it were, in space. Lucifer had charge of opening and closing and traversing Jacob's ladder as the guardian angel of the sun. He would go up to the mountain of God where they would lead in worship service, have Bible study, as it were, doctrinal studies, and Jesus Christ would make rulings for the universe. He would then escort Jesus Christ down to the garden of God where there would be fellowship with the angels. It uh, wasn't all a, a serious business. Jesus Christ would have a little R&R &R with his buddies. He was anointed above his what? Fellows, his friends those who shared with him in this universe. He was not created, but he was appointed over them. He shared in this universe. Now, he came down to earth. Then he would escort him back up. But here is what he said. I will ascend into heaven. I'll exalt, verse 13, my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the mount of God, in the mount of the congregation and the sides of the Lord. I'll ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'll be like the Most High. So, uh, Lucifer again, this was his strategy, where he would go up through Jacob's ladder. But verse number 12 tells us, how are you cut down to the ground? <laughs> what happened? Well, this is where the first creation, as far as earth is concerned, was lost. He stormed heaven's gates through Jacob's ladder, which he had the key to. He opened it up. He took one third of the angels. And Jesus Christ said in Luke, I remember Lucifer fall from heaven as lightning. Now, what is he talking about? <laughs> he got up and in a Mike Tyson type fashion, <laughs> pitiful, $25 million for 89 seconds work. Pitiful. Now, I would not tell him to his face that it's pitiful. But uh, <laughs> as long as he's in Las Vegas and I'm here, I'll say it. But it's pitiful. $25 million. 89 seconds and uh, the fight is over. But that's about as long as this fight lasted. Uh, it went up and the Lord Jesus Christ popped him right in the nose and he, with warp speed, back down Jacob's ladder. He hit the earth, blew the, uh, there was a, an explosion, blew dust into the atmosphere and the earth froze until God the Holy Spirit came and restored it to life. Now, we'll go from there to the, to the last thing here and you've, you've seen this before. Now you understand, as we turn to Luke chapter 1, what I've given you in the birthday of the body of Christ and the reason that Jesus Christ has to have two bodies is something that, in my opinion, is absolutely amazing. You know, when we sing the song, This World Is Not My Home, did you know that Jew and Gentile believers under law cannot, cannot sing that song? Because this world is their home. <laughs> they come back. Luke chapter 1, verse number 32. He, Jesus Christ, shall be, say, uh, shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne 
of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. The whole purpose for the first body of Jesus Christ is to capture the earth that Lucifer forfeited at his fall and Adam forfeited at his fall. Jesus Christ, however, defeated the, uh, the angels on the cross of Calvary and is qualified to be the king of the Jews. Therefore, he is going to uh, be the one to rule over earth. Now, earth is going to be restored as a very lush, beautiful planet again in the uh, restored earth. It's going to be a place where once again people can come for a little R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. They're going to have their own government there as Lucifer had originally, but it's going to be a very beautiful place. You'll have to get your Visa or MasterCard and put in your reservation if you don't ha have one already. But he is going to rule and reign there and bring a reign of righteousness so that there's no more sin. Now, that's why it says he's going to sit on the throne of his father, uh, David. But here is the amazing thing. Ephesians chapter 1. Last part of verse number 22 and 23. When he gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, he said that the church is the fullness of him that fills all in all. You'll remember that it is our contention that God the Father says, if my son wins the angelic conflict, he as a man will sit upon every throne in the universe. <laughs> He's a human being. Wow, well, how can that happen? How can that be? How can the Son of God be everywhere as one man? Uh, and the point is this. He has a second body that is composed of many human beings. And that, and that they are designated the body of Christ and that they have his mind. Note, this body is the fullness of him which fills all in all. The thrones and dominions which were once the realm of the angels now become the realm of the church. That's, uh, that's why I want you all to, to learn doctrine and live by doctrine because at the Bema Seat I want you to get gold, silver, and precious stones so that I'll not have to come visit you in some remote corner of the universe on some <laughs> piddling little planet there that you roll, rule over. I mean, if we're going to visit one another, let's do our best to, to, uh, to have a mansions, a beautiful planet, uh, and, a, and a solar system, you know, that, that uh, is a little meaningful here. Because that's exactly what it is. You are part, you are one of the ones that will fill all in all. You will fill in the thrones of the universe. And uh, again, depending on how much a reward you get, uh, it will depend on where you are placed on one of those thrones in the universe. And you will have access to Jacob's ladder. And you will be able to go up to the place where you represent Verse um, number six in chapter two. In this dispensation, he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. The exceeding riches of grace. That's why the fireball was brighter than the light of the sun. Where sin abounded, grace abounded more. It's more than even the natural light that man has. It's more than the natural way God has worked with man. It is an abundant work of God's grace that man actually could be taken from earth to heaven and float through the universe ruling and reigning over angels and other believers who have not been uh, uh, part of a, of a doctrinal type uh, thrust. So this is 
your home. This is the throne you originally represent. Now you remember that we are associated with the deity of Jesus Christ. Now I want to draw one more thing here. I'm sorry I didn't uh, do it a little better, but turn with me to 1 Corinthians again. As I've shared this with even other believers, I've had this question asked me. Okay, we'll just draw a circle here. The blue is the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll draw another circle here, and you'll know it is attached. And this is body number one. This simple illustration is what we call the hypostatic union, where Jesus Christ was both God and man in one person at one of the same time. Now, the difference is, as God, he cannot sin. As man, he could be tempted and he could have failed. That is why the body is outside of the realm of his deity. He is not less than God. He is not more than man. Now, what do I mean by that? In this hypostatic union type deal, Jesus Christ could not use his deity here to an unfair advantage. Otherwise, he would be a superman. I hope everyone can see that and understand it. Lucifer would have simply said, hey, well, I, sure, I couldn't, beat, I couldn't beat him as God in the first place. That's why God said, I make him lower than the angels, and I will confine the use of his deity to just certain times during the course of his human life, just to show that he is who he says he is. Other than that, have at him as a man. God cannot die, but he died as a man. God cannot be tempted. He was tempted as a man. He could never be less than God, uh, but he could never be more than a man. So this is the hypostatic union. Now, here is the thing with regard to body number two. And we'll put body two up here. First of all, for by one spirit, verse number 13, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, chapter 12, verse 13. Now we're going to have something. I just have a few minutes and then we'll stop. Something that I call the hydrostatic or pneumostatic union. We, as body two, cannot be united with body one. Body one cannot be part of body two. It is two totally separate and distinct entities. Body one is uh, blessed with all that God promised from the foundation of the world. Body two is uh, uh, blessed with all that God promised from before the foundation of the world, with spiritual things. Well, what existed before the foundation of the world? God. And God is what? Spirit. So therefore, this body has something that is different than this body. A higher position, actually, in the universe. Not that this body is not important, but body two is higher positionally than body one. Now let me show you what I mean. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. When believers are saved now, they are placed into the body of Christ. There are the individual members. That's why it says in verse 27, Now are ye the body of Christ and members in particular. But for some reason, Christendom has bypassed the last part of, of verse number 13. I guess because they think it might be blasphemy to, to say so. Uh, I guess uh, uh, a pastor even to, to draw a thing like this and to suggest that we are associated with the deity of Christ. Uh, many people would think that was a, that's blasphemous. Well, then again, anybody that tries to predict the day of the rapture is off his rocker to begin with. I might as well uh, keep be consistent with what they think. And have been all made to drink. Literally, they're saturated into one spirit. The second body of Jesus Christ is associated with his deity. We are, when it says we're united with Christ, 
with body one can't be. It has to be with his deity. We're united in one body, that is, with one another. And we're united with Christ. How then? He places, the, the Holy Spirit places us into the body and then places the body into Christ. That's what it says. We're in Christ. Therefore, we are associated with him in his deity. That's why when we sit there at the, at the right hand of God, uh, God can say, my son as a man is seated on every throne as a universe, in the universe because he simply in his deity can be everywhere at the same time. And he is associated with every member of the body. He simply sends the members of the body to the various places while he as God sits at the right hand of the Father. That throne is our representation and he dispatches us to the universe from that throne. We represent him there through the universe. Now, again, just as we close, how do we know that uh, we're placed into the spiritual aspect of Jesus Christ? It's very simple. We're not placed into the Father, are we? Answer, no. Cross that out. Who's the one doing the bat baptizing? What's the Holy Spirit? He's the one placing us into this entity. So over here, we'll put the Holy Spirit. HS is the Holy Spirit. Do we, are we placed into the Holy Spirit? Answer, no. What is the only other member of the Godhead left into which this body uh, can be placed into that spirit? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is consistent with grace theology. We are said to be in Christ unlike any other believer in any other dispensation, past or future. We are united with Christ so that all that he is, all that he was as God, uh, becomes our distinctive sphere of blessing. Now that does not make us God. We're still mere men. But we're allowed to share together in what he is as God and, um, and represent him accordingly.